You know, when I was your age, go ask your mother. I know you don't like it. It builds character. How many times do I have to tell you? I'm not just talking to hear my own voice. Hello, listener, and welcome to Datages. I'm your host, Chad Hagel. And if you are looking for some fatherly wisdom for your career, your family, or any other aspect of your life, then you've come to the right place. If you want to learn more about Datages, find additional content, submit questions or feedback to me, or if you want to know if that mental picture you have of me after hearing my voice matches my real face, visit datages.com. Thanks for being here. And before you listen to our podcast, please listen to your father. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Datages for Episode 9. I'm your host, Chad Hagel. This episode is the start of something special. I'm devoting the next several episodes of Datages to a topic that is very important to me, philanthropy. The next few episodes will take you all along with me on a journey, a journey through the nonprofit world and the lessons and insights that I've picked up along the way. And you'll be introduced to some special individuals doing great work in philanthropy themselves. Hang around for the next few episodes, and you might just come away with some insights on how to truly be a better person. I know, that's a bold pitch, but I stand by it. Today's dadage is not so much a piece of fatherly advice or wisdom. It's more of a philosophical statement that comes from experience. Here it is. I don't believe in charity. I believe in philanthropic investment. When I say that, for some reason, it reminded me of that groundbreaking scene from one of the true cinematic epics of Hollywood, 2007's Blades of Glory. In the movie, John Hader says, I don't even know what that means. And Will Ferrell replies, no one knows what it means, but it's provocative. Hey, if Jay-Z and Kanye West can sample the line, it's good enough for us here at Datages. I found a clip of the scene on YouTube. If you want to relive the blades and the glory, check it out in our bulletin board. I know I'm being a bit melodramatic with all of this, but today I'm going to tackle this topic by first providing you, listener, with an explanation of the difference between charity and philanthropy, and then we'll take it from there. Let's start with a story. This is the story of my first meaningful engagement in philanthropic volunteer work in my life. Let's go all the way back to August 13th of 2004, Hurricane Charlie. At the time, my mother was living in a small home located right on the intercoastal waterway in New Smyrna Beach, Florida. Like many longtime Floridians, she suffered from intense storm pride. Just so you have some perspective, listener, growing up in Florida, we didn't run from storms. There ain't no way some storm is going to chase me out of my house and home. I'm going to ride it out. You have to understand, by birth, I am Florida man. This attitude of bravado is quite prevalent in Florida, particularly among natives or longtime residents. I see a bit of the same blind confidence regarding tornadoes now living in the heart of Tornado Alley here in Texas. The personification of Storm Pride is, of course, a real-life Florida man, Lane Pittman. You probably don't know Lane. Lane has become internet famous for a series of videos he has shot standing in the path of several hurricanes, proudly hoisting an American flag being pummeled by rain and wind all while headbanging and rocking out to Slayer. If you've never visited our bulletin board at datages.com, please, I beg of you, hit pause. Go there now. Click on the link to Lane Pittman's YouTube channel. Last I checked, it had 4,534,416 views. All those people can't be wrong. You will thank me. Okay, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed Lane's extreme storm pride on display. As I said, 
My mother was among those suffering from storm pride in 2004 when Charlie hit, and it hit hard. The way she tells the story, she was in her home, curled up in the bathtub, holding on to her Labrador retriever buck with a mattress pulled over them when the roof of the house was torn off by the storm. Her home was devastated and rendered completely uninhabitable. Thank God she survived. And in the aftermath of the storm, the cleanup took weeks and the process of battling the insurance company and trying to be able to rebuild her home and then find contractors available to do the work, that all stretched out for months, leaving her homeless. In that time of need, my mother only survived by the grace and generosity of her neighbors in the local community. She lived in a borrowed RV parked in her own driveway throughout that entire ordeal. Almost two years, in fact. At the time, it was a place in my life, just starting out and building my business and moving into my first home with a six-month-old son, and I was unable to help my mother in any material way. I remain grateful to this day when all of her friends and neighbors came to her aid in her time of great need. Fast forward a year to August 29th, 2005, Hurricane Katrina. In that year that had passed between Charlie and Katrina, my business and my life had really turned a corner, and I had more resources and independence. When Katrina made landfall in Louisiana and decimated entire cities, I felt compelled to pay forward the generosity and consideration that had been paid to my mother in her time of need. I was at home in Scottsdale, Arizona at the time, I got on the phone and started calling every volunteer organization I could think of to figure out how I could get involved. The Red Cross, the Salvation Army, you name it. And the response I got? There's no way you can help. If you travel into the area where relief work is occurring, you will only put yourself in harm's way and may interfere with relief efforts. Here's our website. You can make a monetary contribution there to support the effort. Eh. Two questions occurred to me. I knew I was a capable individual, a problem solver, and physically able. How could I not be of some value to the cause? And two, how could me giving money to these massive charitable organizations actually translate to a direct benefit for those individuals in need right now at this very moment? We'll come back and explore that second question in just a few minutes. Stand by for that. I was determined and undeterred. They weren't going to stop me from helping. Perhaps it was that same Florida man defiant spirit showing itself again in this moment. So I did some research, identified that the majority of the refugees had been relocated to Houston, and booked myself a one-way ticket to Houston the same day. I packed some clothes in a duffel bag, I jumped in my car and drove to the airport, well, at the airport, waiting for my plane, I went online and found a rental car, booked a hotel that still had some availability on the outskirts of Houston, and bought myself a Sony VAIO laptop computer with a Verizon cellular data card at a Best Buy near the airport in Houston. I did so because I didn't have a laptop at the time, and I felt like I needed to remain connected to my own business in some way because after all, I didn't even have a return ticket and had no idea when I was coming home. There was no way I could have known at the moment how important that laptop purchase would be. When I landed in Houston in the late afternoon, I got in my rental car, went to Best Buy, got my new computer, activated it in the store to make sure it would work, and then drove promptly to the Reliance Center, where the majority of the refugees were being housed. I pulled up behind the Reliance Center, the indoor football stadium, and saw a delivery truck there with two or three men. They were unloading large bags. I found a place to park my car, just walked over and said three words, can I help? The men looked at me and smiled and said, absolutely, grab some rice, get it inside to the soup kitchen. The entire truck was filled with large sacks of rice. I joined the men in their work and started throwing bags over my shoulder and marching them into the building with only one thought in my mind. Hey, Red Cross, look at me. I'm helping. 
I was in no way prepared for what I encountered on the inside of the Reliance Center. I can only describe it with one word, humanity. Humanity in every sense, on the largest scale I had ever seen. Sheer masses of people lined across the football field, in the stands, on the concourses, around the perimeter of the entire building. Cots laid side by side by side in seemingly endless rows. This monstrous building was now simply known as home to thousands of people. At its peak, the cluster of refugee centers, including the Astrodome and the Reliance Center, housed 27,100 refugees. But when I talk about humanity, I mean a lot more. I'm talking about human compassion, care, and kindness on display on a truly inspiring order of magnitude. It literally brought a tear to my eye as I lugged sacks of rice back and forth from the loading bay to the commissary. This would not be the only time I'd find myself crying during my stay in Houston. What transpired over the next two weeks truly changed my life and my perspective about the world forever. While I spent the first two or three days engaged primarily in manual labor, putting my body to work to help others, things quickly evolved and I began to see other needs and other ways I could be of help. I got a crash course in disaster real estate. I'm not referring to disastrous real estate deals. That's something completely different. I'm referring to a deeper philosophical relationship between people and places, whether they be physical places or virtual places. In 2005, at the time of Katrina, many at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale, like the majority of the Katrina refugees, didn't have cell phones. They didn't have computers. They didn't have email addresses. And they had all their physical addresses, their homes, just completely taken away from them by the storm. What happens to us as human beings when you completely take away any point of connection we have to the world? If we have no address, no phone number, no email, no social media presence, do we cease to exist? I don't think we cease to exist per se, but we certainly cease to be identifiable, reachable, connected to our fellow humans. All of the Katrina refugees were relegated to an identifying address that was something like Cot C, Row 22, Reliance Center, Houston, Texas. You can't exactly FaceTime someone at that address. Perhaps if a disaster on the scale of Katrina happened today, this vanishing effect that I'm talking about would be less prevalent due to advances in mobile devices and applications for connectivity and how prevalent they are at every socioeconomic level. I mean, I've even seen homeless people in San Francisco with a cell phone and a data plan. But in 2005, the Katrina refugees had vanished to the rest of the world. Families were separated with relatives sent to different refugee centers, sometimes in different cities and states. Family members were lost to one another, with little hope of being able to reconnect and no knowledge of whether or not close relatives and friends had even survived. It was an epic problem and very saddening. This is the problem that I and many others in Houston set out to address. We started creating what in today's terms would be called an ad hoc social network. We pieced together a website that was organized by Relocation Center and started to populate the website with names, identifying information, and status. It was the equivalent of marking yourself as safe in Facebook as we see in disasters today. I was working with the local Verizon franchisee at the time who was helping to build a cellular network to connect all of these refugees with their family members in other cities. I ended up staying at the Reliance Center. I released my hotel room to make way for a refugee family. I didn't need it, and there was too much work to be done on site. One week into the effort to reconnect to refugee families, we were having conference calls with executives from Oracle, Microsoft, Yahoo, and Cisco working to scale the effort to help unite families and friends throughout the entire disaster zone. It was 
quite a surreal experience for me to go from sitting at home in Arizona to landing in Houston to carrying rice to participating in a groundbreaking rapid response network deployment with a collection of multinational Fortune 500 technology companies. But the real impact of this whole time was on a more personal level. The most striking story that remains vividly in my mind as I speak to you here today is that of Clarence. Clarence was a gentleman of modest means in his late 60s or early 70s who was among the Reliance Center refugees from New Orleans, Metairie to be precise. He had been living with his adult niece and nephew prior to the storm, and they had been separated in the chaos and sent to different refugee centers. Like all the other refugees, he was completely cut off. He was sad and scared and quite disoriented being on his own for the first time in many years without a family or a community. I processed his registration in our refugee network one morning and I can remember him sitting there in a folding chair on the concrete floor saying, I don't know how my family is going to find me. They don't even know where to look. I'm going to head back over to my cot now. You know where to find me at least. It was two nights later that a call came in to one of our cell phone banks at the Reliance Center around 2 a.m. I was at the phone desk at the time. It turned out to be Clarence's niece. I remember picking up that phone and sprinting across the concrete floors, down a corridor, and onto the field. I sought out Clarence's little patch of space that was his temporary home. I roused him from a light sleep and handed him the phone. Clarence, you're going to want to take this. I kneeled there on the hard ground as Clarence took the phone and said, Hello? And then I saw him break down in tears at the sound of his niece's voice. I I cried with him as I listened to him establish that his family was alive and well in Mississippi, and he made a tentative plan as to how and where they would reunite. That remains one of the most indelible memories of my entire life. As I said, ultimately I spent two weeks in Houston, and it was a formative experience for me in many ways. Those two weeks would go on to be the impetus behind my shift in my life plan over the next couple of years to focus more on philanthropy, and they would become the foundation for my perspective regarding charity, volunteerism, and philanthropy in my own life. Let's talk about those perspectives now. When I say, I don't believe in charity, I believe in philanthropic investment, what do I really mean? First, let me provide you some clarity on the definitions of these two terms. I'm drawing heavily from Jen Jope, the editor-in-chief of Giving Compass, which is a nonprofit organization devoted to helping individuals find their way into meaningful philanthropic engagement. She states the following, Charity and philanthropy are sometimes used interchangeably but there are noticeable differences. Charity is a natural emotional impulse to an immediate situation, and giving usually occurs in the short term. Charity can take the form of monetary donations or volunteering. Philanthropy addresses the root cause of social issues and requires a more strategic long-term approach. In addition to giving money or volunteering, Some philanthropists participate in advocacy work. Regardless of the issue area, the two terms and practices share one main thing in common. They're all about spreading the love. The original meaning of charity, Christian love of one's fellow, is rooted in late Old English, while philanthropy, or the love of humanity, originated in Greek. When charity entered the English lexicon by way of Old French's charit, the meaning evolved to what we are familiar with today, giving help or money to those in need. Meanwhile, the practice of modern philanthropy is often credited to titans of industry like Andrew Carnegie and John D. Rockefeller. Listener, I hope that helps you understand the difference between charity and philanthropy from a pure dictionary definition standpoint. Now let me layer on top of that some additional differences between how I look at charity and philanthropy. These contrasts are just the perspectives of Chad Hagel. Please don't take them as official or technical differences between the two terms. I'm sure many of you consider them differently than I do. When I differentiate between charity and philanthropy, I consider the motivations and the participation of the recipient. 
When I think of charity, I think of giving without expectation of the recipient. If you choose to give money to someone panhandling on the sidewalk or at a freeway off-ramp, you aren't likely asking them to outline their spending plan and commit to reporting and accountability standards before you make your donation. Giving in these circumstances is done without expectation and without any sense of what the recipient might be doing to be self-reliant and invest in their own well-being. In my concept of philanthropy, on the other hand, there is certainly accountability. Whether giving to an organization or an institution or an individual, there is an expectation that the recipient is actively working to achieve an objective. There is a plan for that objective, and the funds given are being used for a stated purpose to achieve the objective. Similarly, when I compare charity and philanthropic investment, I also consider the motivations and the participation of the donor. In talking about philanthropy, many experts on the topic speak about the three T's, time, talent, and treasure. And I think these are provided in the proper order. I consider myself an activist philanthropic investor. I've heard others use this term activist in a negative context in the fundraising world to describe individuals that try to buy influence and change the trajectory of institutions by making large financial gifts. But in my model, if you want to call it that, the most valuable commodity in philanthropy is engagement. I think individual philanthropists make better giving decisions when they take the time to study a recipient organization. And there's no better way to study than from the inside, getting under the hood and being actively involved in the activities of that organization. And I can tell you from personal experience that when you're actively giving of your time and energy to a cause, It's far more rewarding to see your money put to good use versus just blindly writing a check. The great Lebanese-American author, poet, and philosopher, Khalil Gibran, who wrote The Prophet, said, You give but little when you give of your possessions. It is when you give of yourself that you truly give. There are benefits for the recipient organization as well in having active and engaged volunteer donors. The organization gains access to the expertise, the guidance, and the leadership of those donors, and often their Rolodex of other potential donors. And a donor actively involved in an organization is far more likely to be a long-term contributor rather than just writing a check and going away. I think this model really creates a lasting philanthropic partnership that is capable of achieving great things. The terms charity and philanthropy, in my view, don't indicate a particular nature or size of the recipient. Both charity and philanthropy can be on a small scale at an individual level and on a large scale with major organizations. For an illustration of this, let's look more closely at the Red Cross and disaster relief. Going back to Jen Jope, she wrote this, Disaster relief is an example of where charity and philanthropy both play a role. When we see a tragedy in the news or via social media, many of us are inclined to provide aid for basic necessities during an emergency. This is charity. On the other hand, philanthropy looks at the full disaster relief life cycle, from prevention to preparedness to recovery. Donors may focus on certain populations, such as the elderly or the poor, as part of their strategy or work directly with stakeholders to improve systems. Listener, which of these two approaches am I more likely to support? Go back to the dadage. I'm more likely to practice philanthropy. Let's together explore a bit more the notion of large institutional charities and how they operate, looking at the case of disaster relief. The most obvious organization to evaluate is the Red Cross. Large organizations like the Red Cross appeal heavily to the emotions of prospective donors in order to source donations during major disasters. Think Hurricane Katrina and the uh, Indian Ocean Tsunami. Those are great examples. There are concerts, telethons, lots of imagery of children suffering, and those handy five or six digit short codes to instantly send money to disaster relief from your cell phone. Let me interject here that any system that is set up to accelerate the process of you making a decision to spend your money 
for any purpose, it's probably not being built to encourage thoughtful spending. It's probably been established to capitalize upon an impulse buy reflex on your part. If someone asks you to spend your money in six clicks on your iPhone, perhaps take a pause, count to 10, and think for just a minute about why you're giving, where the money's going, and how it'll be used. I urge you, please, not to just text your money away unless you really just want to clear your conscience and feel like you've done your part. Let's go back to Katrina. Reporting shows that at least $18.5 billion of legitimate charitable dollars were raised through various charitable organizations around Hurricane Katrina. We'll come back to that word legitimate in a moment. The Red Cross accounted for over $2 billion of that money. And how much of it ended up going directly to the victims of the disaster? That's not an easy question to answer, but Let me share a few points with you that will at least help you to understand the picture. First, the Red Cross officially reports that about 90% of every donation goes directly toward its program services, meaning that 10% of its budget goes to salaries and operating overhead. An independent investigation in 2014 by NPR and ProPublica said that the Red Cross's percentage of funds used toward programming could be closer to 70%, meaning 30% is going to salaries and operating overhead. And there are some significant salaries at the Red Cross. According to an article by the Columbus Dispatch that came out in 2020, the salary of the CEO of the Red Cross in 2018 was $694,000. And there are several board members and senior executives making high six figures. Now back to those program services we were talking about. $1.74 billion, over half of the annual $3 billion budget for the Red Cross, goes to fund biomedical services, blood banks. Now, that's not really direct disaster relief. But that's worth supporting, right? I don't know. Let's take a closer look at these numbers. These biomedical services involve collecting blood and selling, that's right, selling it to hospitals. So charitable contributions are going to support activities that in turn are revenue producing for the Red Cross. And more than half of those monies being spent under the heading of biomedical services they're going to employee wages and benefits. I'm not going to make any value judgment here. I'll let you come to your own conclusion, listener. But what I can tell you is this bottom line figure. The amount of money the Red Cross spends directly toward disaster relief within its overall budget of $3 billion? $667 million. About 22%. So the next time you hear... Send money for this disaster. Think to yourself instead. Send money so that 22% of what you give can go to this disaster. And think about timing also. Do you think the Red Cross operates so efficiently as an organization that in a time of crisis they can directly and instantaneously mobilize funds they receive to assist in the present disaster? Perhaps what you should actually think to yourself before... Stroking those six buttons on your phone and giving money the Red Cross is, send money today so that the money you give now can go to establish our budget for next year and beyond to address future disasters, or at least 22% of it will. So is the notion of giving to support real-time disaster relief completely unachievable? I don't think so. It just requires a bit more effort. Let me provide a visual explanation in order to share with you one of the greatest lessons I learned in my experiences in Houston around Katrina. Picture, if you will, two gigantic funnels aligned so that their tips are connected. Imagine the tremendous mouth of one funnel represents the massive needs of a population impacted by a terrible disaster. Imagine the equally large mouth of the other funnel represents all of the resources that exist to support those people on the other side. The tips of the funnels, aligned with one another, 
represent the infrastructure that exists to deliver the resources on one side to the needs on the other. Is this ever really going to work? Not really in my mind. It's impossible for any governmental agency like FEMA or any collection of non-governmental organizations, NGOs as they are known, to ever build and sustain enough of a structure to serve as a conduit for meeting a crisis level of disaster relief in such a way that they can effectively connect 100% of the resources and needs to one another. My answer to this, instead of those two funnels I just talked about, now imagine a million straws lined up side by side by side. To me, that represents one-to-one connection. It's very easy to imagine the resources flowing directly from one individual, one family, one church perhaps, to one individual, family, or small community on the other side. It's by building these direct one-to-one connections that relief at an individual level can be achieved and multiplied to meet the needs of an entire population impacted by a crisis. That one man that loaned my mom his RV for a year, my connection with Clarence and the other individual lives I touched in Houston, to me, that's the recipe for effective emergency deployment of philanthropic aid in moments of crisis. So listener, now you know some of the experiences in my life that caused me to devote so much of my time and energy to philanthropy over the past 15 years or so. And you now know how some of my perspectives about charity and philanthropy have been formed. I hope these stories and insights are meaningful to you. There's more to come, though. In the coming episodes, I will share how my engagement in philanthropy has shaped my life and the additional lessons I've learned through deeper and deeper engagement in philanthropy, particularly in and around education. And then I'll introduce you to the concept of for-profit philanthropy. Please stay tuned. As always, I leave you now with the dad joke of the day. Why doesn't the invisible man ever give to charity? He just can't see himself doing it. Remember, everyone, dad may not always know what he's talking about, but he sure can sound like he does. Thank you for listening to Dadages. If you enjoyed this episode, remember to visit dadages.com and subscribe to the Dadages podcast to get notified for future episodes. You can rate or review on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Why? Because I'm your father and I said so. Just a little respect is all I ask for. I put a roof over your head and food on the table. And what do you do? No, tell me exactly what do you do? Because I am doing everything. I'm paying for everything. No, get back here. Get back here right now.